All right, to start part two of this, I know that we had to break scientific method up. Um, I am limited to 15 minutes with these videos. So let's rehash what we went through so far. We're analyzing data, the fifth step of the scientific method, and we really have to understand how to graph. And that's a really important tool in this course and for many science courses beyond this. When should I a line graph and bar graph? Um, students do get confused with this and you have to understand what's the purpose of it. Line graphs, again, observing a trend. I'm looking at two things that have a correlation where if I increase one variable, the other will also do something. Whether it is go up or down, as long as there's a trend or a correlation, you're going to do a line graph. Bar graphs comparison. The X or horizontal line on the graph will be the independent variable. The Y axis will be the dependent variable. So that goes back into understanding what controls what. What information should be in my title? Never versus. All right, you're not going to do anything this versus that. Do not put it in there. You will lose points immediately. Um, to now pick up where we left, you're going to include both the independent and dependent variable. By the time I um, get done reading your title, I should understand what the two things that you are really testing. A lot of students include independent very easily and readily but they often forget to put the dependent variable. So you've got to make sure that when you're looking at your graph, even after you're done with it, you look at it and say, are both of the things that are listed on my X and Y axis included in the title? And also uh, how they are related. If they are correlated to one another, most often using a line graph, then you often say the effect of, because a correlation means that there's a cause-effect relationship. So you're going to include something like that. So if I want to say, um, how does the amount of water control the height of the plant? What I would say is, water is controlling the height of the plant. So water is my independent variable. Height of the plant, I don't have control over. That is what my dependent variable would be. So then my x-axis would have the amount of water, whether it is um, one milliliter, two milliliter, so on and so forth. And then the y would be the height of the plant. Because you would say that there's a cause-effect relationship, then I would say the effect of water on the height of the plant. So the effect of tells you how they're related. It says that there's an effect, a cause-effect relationship. If I was doing something like a bar graph, I would probably have something with a comparison. So if I was doing with comparing the amount of liquid absorbed by various brands of paper towels, I would include a comparison of very, like basically what I just said would be a, an effective title. The comparison of various brands of paper towel on their absorption rate. So what I'm doing is it says that I'm not doing a cause effect, I'm doing a comparison. So that should be included. Your titles on these graphs actually will be pretty lengthy. They're more phrases as opposed to, um, you know, something like water versus plant height, not doing that. That doesn't really give you as much information. So I oftentimes find that students, when their data on a graph, you have four quadrants. You most often graph in the upper right-hand quadrant where you have a positive both x-axis and positive y-value. Um, but many times your values aren't actually starting at 0, 0. So in previous years, you might have been taught to do the little squiggly line. You are not to do the squiggly line, unfortunately. So that's something you might have to, a habit you might have to break. So let's, all right, let's move this down. So no squiggly line. I guess that's not a word. Or how do you spell squiggly? No, no. So no squiggly line. Instead, you're going to adjust your axes. So, I'll, you know, I can show you in person when you would do that, but what you're going to do is your, your origin is not going to be necessarily at zero, zero. The origin where the X and Y axes line meet might actually be a number. So if you ever adjust your origin to not be 0, 0, you should always identify what your origin is on a graph. That's really a standard thing you should do. Whether it's 0, 0, or say that your first data point on the x-axis starts at 100, you're not going to waste all that space getting over there. So maybe the origin of your new graph is starting at 100. So you would, you would put that number down first. All right, you just shift the graph over and you're just going to be showing the portion that includes the data and that's perfectly fine. So avoid doing, you're not doing the squiggly line. Next question I get is when should I do a line of best fit? When you see there is an actual trend. If you see that there is a trend and it's a predictable trend, then what you do is you can do a line of best fit. 
but the line of best fit also could be a curve. So if a trend is visible, a line of best fit is appropriate. So if you look at your data when it's all said and done, say, oh, I can kind of see that if I did more, more of the, the variable, if I increase it even more, I can predict what's going to happen. If you can do that, then you're going to do a line of best fit. If the data is somewhat all over the place and it's not predictable, you can't do a line of best fit. You would unfortunately do a connect the dot type of idea. But most often, if there is no correlation there, then really your, your whole experiment, you really have to restart. So other rules of graphing, you're always going to use a straight edge. We're, we're not really going to do electronic graphing here. We are going to do a paper and pencil graph. So your straight edge, which is a ruler, is going to be used to draw all of your x-axes and y-axes. It's very, very recognizable when a student does not use a straight edge to do an x and y, no matter how much you think it is actually. When you compare them to 100 students at the same time, it's very obvious when someone does not. Spacing of the axes. Um, from the origin out to wherever the last data point is, your axes between those numbers should always be the same. So every square on a graph that is handwritten should have the same, it should represent the same unit of measurement. Speaking of unit of measurement, you should have units on anything that has, whether it's length, whether it's mass, whether it's um, volume, anything that you know is going to have a measurement you need to tell the individual temperature better have something like, is it Celsius or Fahrenheit? Is it milliliters? Is it gallons? Things like that. So those are all other rules of graphing. So what I want you to do is take a look at this and you're going to graph using the rules that we just went through. So you're not going to see this. So I'm just going to say this is a practical, ap practical application of the, the rules of graphing that I just went through. So we do this in class. I'll analyze it. I'll let you know what you did or did not do correctly, but what I want you to do is take this data and put it into this graph. Once you have graphed all your data, you are literally at your final step, which is draw conclusions. And this is going to be something where you're going to go back to your, your information and say, did this, did I agree with my hypotheses? I looked at all my data and now I say, do I agree with it? So if I look back at the three hypotheses that I type, now I think, well, which one is most likely to be in agreement with my data? If you look at these, the measurable hypothesis puts the most parameters on your data. You have to be, for this example, 85% of students. So if this number um, was outside of 85%, you potentially can say, I can not really agree with my hypotheses. Directional just says it has to be less likely, whereas general just says there has to be a correlation. So when you do a drawing conclusion, you kind of go back to each of these that you writ have written down and say, is my data showing this? The most often one that would be disagreed upon immediately would be this one because it, as I said, it has the most parameters. It's the most specific. Then the directional and least likely in this case would be the general hypothesis. So when you look at two variables, you know, as long as there was a correlation here, you can see that there was something that the, the data points had some trend in it, regardless if it was less likely or more likely. Soon as you get to directional, you have limited yourself to only the less likely scenario. If it was more likely, then you have to disregard this hypothesis and say, I, it is not correct. So those are the steps to the scientific method. Um, again, from book to book, they somewhat might summarize them differently. They might collapse some of them. They might have more steps, but that's a very general idea of the scientific method. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll stop there with this video and that will conclude scientific method. We'll jump to the next category of information in the, in the, uh, in the following videos.